Welcome to Transferring to the PCB as we look at the steps required to transfer our completed design to the PCB. With the project compiled and free of errors, we are now ready to transfer it. Opening up a Components Property window, we can see that it has a footprint model. This link to a PCB library footprint is part of the schematic symbol creation and is used when transferring the design from the schematic to the PCB. Clicking on the footprint model and then edit, we can see the PCB footprint model selection window open. Here we can see the footprint model either in 2D or 3D by clicking on the button. We will cover adding footprints and models later in the library creation module. For now, understand that we could change the footprint here if needed, say changing it from an 0603 to an 0805 size. Hitting the Browse button, we can see the available footprints from the current PCB library. Again, we won't change this here, but it's one way to swap footprints if needed. This would not be recommended as it only affects this one component. If you pull another copy of the component from the library, it would not have these changes. That said, it could be exactly what is needed. The approach that I have taken with prior designs is to create new components with the needed features, either footprint options or, say for example, a resistor value. This allows for the part number and supplier information to be accurate and built into the part. Closing all the windows, we turn our attention to the Footprint Manager, where we can manage the footprints for the entire design. To access the Footprint Manager, go to Tools and select Footprint Manager. Note if the design was not compiled in this session of Altium, it will now recompile. The Footprint Manager provides a single window for checking or verifying the schematic component's footprints, as well as changing them if needed. As you can see, there is a component list showing all of the components in the design. Clicking on one of the components populates the two sub-windows on the right. We can see the footprint named and, if listed, the library that it is from, as well as a 2D or 3D view. If it could not find the footprint, the view would be blank. You will notice in the middle of the window on the right a series of buttons. The Menu button is a pull-down and it gives you some of the same options as the Visible buttons, as well as a few more. One interesting menu option is the Change PCB Library, where we could redirect the selected component's footprint to be taken from another library. To illustrate this in action, let's walk through the process. We will start by selecting a component, and then we will select Change PCB Library option from the menu. Clicking on the library path, we could navigate to another library, perhaps a special library with custom versions of the footprints. I use this approach for an RF PCB design when consulting at the request of the customer. They had custom footprints that had been tuned for solder mask and pad dimensions. These provided better performance at their particular frequencies, and in addition, we removed all of the silkscreen so that the devices could be more closely butted together without silkscreen or solder mask issues. This tightened the RF chain and made placement easier for some of the PC boards. We will cancel out of this process so as not to make changes, but if we wanted to make changes, we would have used the Accept Changes, Create ECO button here, and then ran the ECO from the ECO window that pops up. We will just close out of the ECO window and the Change window for now. One important thing to do before releasing the design to start the PCB effort would be to ensure that all the footprints exist and can be found by Altium. This is the function of the Validate button. To do this for the project, select all the components starting at the top and scrolling down, holding the shift key when you select the last entry. Now with all the components selected, you will see their footprints listed on the right. We will select all the listed footprints and then hit the Validate button. Once the verification is finished, we should scroll down and check for missing footprints. If a component's footprint can't be found, then the transfer to the PCB will not work and may generate a lot of errors. If we can't verify a footprint, the next step would be to correct it, assuming we do have the footprint, but just not where the component was pointing to. We would now select that footprint and then use the Edit button. From here, we would try the Any button first to see if this name footprint is in any of the currently installed libraries. Or if needed, click on the Library Path button and then navigate to choose the library that contains the footprint. Now that we have updated and ensure that we have our footprints, we are ready to transfer the design. First, let's add a blank PC board to the project and save it. 
If you don't save it, then the tool will not be able to find the file on the disk and will error out in the design transfer. To transfer the design, click on the Design pull-down menu tab, then select Update PCB Document. This will generate an ECO. If you remember the unified data model discussion from our earlier modules, the compile caused by the Update PCB Document action will generate the UDM or unified data model from the schematics and then compare it to the PCB. With an empty PCB, it will find missing everything, components, nets, rooms for the components, etc., and will want to add them to the PCB. The rooms are based on the schematic sheets and contain the components on each sheet. These will be useful later on to aid in PCB placement of components. Click on the Execute Changes to perform the ECO. Now we close the ECO, making sure to check the Show Only Errors checkbox first to see if there are any errors. Normally, errors are caused by missing footprints preventing the component to be added to the PCB. In that case, all of the connections that would go to that missing component can't be made as well. All these generate errors. At this point, we can see that all the components are placed next to the blank PC board, ready to be moved into their final locations. Placement and routing will be covered in a later module. For now, let's look at some of the features of Altium Designer with projects that have both schematics and a PCB. Given that common database, or UDM, we have a seamless logical connection between the schematic components and their physical footprints. One nice feature is the ability to select components in the schematics and have them highlighted in the PCB. This works in both directions and is a major help in tracking down parts of a design or trying to understand the interconnection of the design components. Let's check to ensure that cross select is set up by looking under the tools drop down menu to see if it's enabled. Now, when we click on a schematic component and highlight it, switching to the PCB, you'll notice that that component is now highlighted on the PCB. As I said, this works in both directions. One other nice feature that PCB designers can use is to select a series of components in the schematic highlighting the group of them in the PCB. At that point, they can use the component placement feature from the tool's drop-down menus, like so. This allows them to sequentially place the selected components. If, in fact, you had selected the components in a particular order, the placement would follow that order of selection. I take this approach for RF chains to get the order and placement directly from the schematic for starting the PCB placement. Now at this point, we have successfully transferred our design to the PCB, and the layout effort could begin. Before we move on in our training to the PCB side, there are a few more schematic-related features to explore. In Altium, rules drive everything on the PC board. I like to say rules rule, but how can a schematic designer help the PCB effort from the schematics? Well, by providing additional information in the form of rules that transfer over to the PC board from the schematic. Remember the electrical rule check directives that we placed to address the errors for single pin nets, which we expected to have? Well, there are a few other directives that are very useful. One is the differential pair directive. To create a differential pair in the schematics, you would need both positive and negative net names like clock P and clock N. Now you would tell the tool that these are differential pairs by adding a differential pair directive to them from the Place, Directives, and selecting the Differential Pair option. This gives you a directive that needs to be placed on both the positive and negative nets of a differential pair. At this point, the tool knows that these are a pair because of the differential pair directives coupled with the same base name having the N and P attached. This would create what is called a differential pair class that can be used in the PCB rules. If one of the pair is not tagged with the directive, an error will be generated from the compile indicating a missing differential pair net. Before we place this particular directive on the nets, let's hit the tab key so we can get its parameter window open. We can add a rule to this directive that would drive the creation of rules in the PC board. To add a rule, click on the Add as Rule button. This brings up an important concept, one that is often overlooked. The schematics should as much as possible be the source for the design driving the PCB, not the other way around. Making changes to the logic and or net connections on the PCB can cause issues, as it is not recommended. 
always update the schematics and transfer to the PCB any needed changes. This avoids documentation issues and finger pointing later on. So now that we have clicked the add on rule, this opens up another window where we can specify a rule by clicking on the edit rule values button. Then we pick a rule. For the differential pair, we would want to pick a rule under that routing category for differential pairs. Clicking OK on our selection opens up the PCB rule window where we could add the required trace widths, min max and preferred gap information, as well as other parameters needed to fully define how this differential pair should be constructed. Clicking OK, we now have a rule added to the directive that will be applied to every net that this directive is placed on. We can also see this added rule parameter in the directive. Moving away from differential pair directives, we can see that there are general directives that we could add. And these are called PCB rule directives. Just like before with the differential pair, to add a rule, we would click the Add as Rule button and then select Edit the Rule. Here we will add a width rule for, in this case, a high current net. So every net with this directive placed on it will require wider widths. Adding rule directives to the schematic provides for a better flow between the schematic designer and the PCB designer. Most companies have different groups performing these two tasks. The advantage of this is the PCB designer knows upfront about differential pairs, high current nets needing increased widths, or high voltage nets needing greater clearances. This avoids the back and forth sometimes needed in the initial transfer stage with clear designer intents being transmitted via written rules. Now that we've made changes to the schematics, we would need to retransfer the design to the PCB. This follows the same process that we did before. Design, update PCB, an ECO will be generated, and running the ECO and then verifying that it worked. Note at this time there's not much being ECO'd, but we do see the rules being added. In this module, we'll recover the final preparations for the schematics for transferring to the PCB. We added rules to the schematic to better document the designer intent and verified the needed footprints were available. We are now ready to move into the full PCB layout phase at this point.